years of what we will look at today, and that is the Great Tribulation. Uh, the, we'll be preaching a little different this morning than what we normally do on a Sunday morning. Normally, uh, this would be more that I would do on some Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, but just have questions. I have had many questions about the Tribulation, uh, what occurs next, what it is, who's in it, who participates, what's going to happen. Uh, we're inquisitive people, aren't we? And we should know. Nothing wrong with wanting to know. In fact, if God had not intended for us to know, He wouldn't have put it in the Scriptures. And so He wants us to stay to show ourselves approved. He wants us to understand so then we can speak to others. And that is what we're supposed to do. I mean, that's, we come here to worship the Lord, but we come here to get, to get filled uh, and, and, and become more knowledgeable in the Word of God. And so we can go out and present what we learn to a lost and dying world that they might also come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so uh, the good news is we're going to talk about the tribulation a little bit. The bad news is, and I was looking this morning, I've walked out here with more notes than I've ever had in the pulpit in my life. Normally my notes are about four pages max. Two to four pages, four pages max. And I number them on top in case I drop them on the way out here and I have to pick them up and, uh, and get them back in order of, of my thoughts that we're looking at. But then when I looked at this, it starts with number one and it ends with page 24. So just get comfortable. <laughs> Amen. We'll skip part of that, I'll promise you. We will skip part of that, but I just want to keep my thoughts Right. There's parts of it that are, that are down there just for me, uh, just to help. Because if I write something down a couple times, I remember it. Sometimes I just need a word. So there's more in there than what I will use this morning, so don't panic. But just get comfortable, and let's try to look ahead in time. Uh, I do believe the next great thing on God's timetable is the rapture of the church. I believe He can come back at any moment. According to the Word of God, I don't find anything or read anything that has to happen to prevent the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when He will stop in the clouds and shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and shout for His church, His people, to come home. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father and He's waiting on God to say, Son, go get my children. And that command, I believe, could happen at any time. And when it does, this world is going to face what we talk about as the tribulation. Seven years divided in the middle, three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days on both sides. And, and the, the first part is called the tribulation. The second part is called the great tribulation uh, as we study through the Word of God. We will surely not touch, I'm not going to go into the different uh, plagues and the different vials and bowls and trumpets. Uh, we're not going to go into all that this morning. We, we, in fact, we have talked through the book of the Revelation verse by verse. It took us almost two years and we talked through and we talked through those verse by verse and so we've covered that. We'll do it again someday. But that's not the purpose of this morning. Uh, this morning, the main thought I want you to get is if you are not ready for the rapture, you need to get ready. Uh, how do you prepare for the rapture? Well, you get saved by the grace of God. You accept what is free. You accept what God has done for you, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you are what we will call rapture ready. Amen? In other words, you're ready to meet the Lord. But I want to talk. Let's go ahead and read our text this morning. And we'll be going uh, back and forth between 2 Thessalonians and throughout the book of the Revelation. Uh, we'll be reading different verses. There's no need for you to try to keep up with me. In fact, that's one reason my notes are so long. I wrote those uh, scriptures down to where I wouldn't have to flip pages for the sake of time. And so I'll read them for you. If you're looking for them, by the time you get there, uh, I'm already going to be gone to something else and you're going to miss it. So I'm asking for your ear. You can follow me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we'll read the first 12 verses there to start our text and then we'll preach for a little bit. The Bible says 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 starting in verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Well, what is that? When we as the church, the people of God, when we all gather together under Him, what do we call that? The rapture, right? 
That'll be the gathering of the entire church unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So the rapture is occurring here in verse number 1. By our gathering together unto him, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. You get that? That day shall not come. Understand that the Thessalonians had been being taught that the rapture had already occurred. And so Paul is trying to comfort them and telling them this event has not taken place yet. In fact, here he's going to give us two things that must take place before the rapture can. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, number one, except there come a falling away first. All right? A falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, which is the Antichrist, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The Greek word, the lie there, can be translated antichrist. So in other words, he, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie or believe the antichrist. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege to one more time stand here behind this sacred desk to open the pages of the Scriptures to read from within. Now, Father, I pray that you'd help to bring to our mind the things that we've studied, the things that you've revealed to us, Lord God, uh, and, and that, Lord God, would help us to present this message in a way that would be hopeful and insightful to your people. And yet, Lord, it would be strong conviction to anyone that may not know you as Savior. Lord, you know the hearts of everyone sitting here today. I truly don't. I surely don't. I'm not hard to fool, Lord. I'm not hard to, to live a lie in front of and me think you're someone something that they're not, Lord. But none of us can live a lie before you. You know the hearts of every man, woman uh, that is in these pews today. You know if they've truly been saved by the grace of God. And so, Father, today, Lord, if they have then I pray that you would encourage them through the Word, that you would uh, give them the zeal they need to go out and share the Word. But if they've never been saved, I pray, Lord God, somehow the Holy Ghost of God could bring such strong conviction into their life, they would see the need of a Savior. Lord, we know that this event that we're talking about lies ahead. How far ahead? We do not know. We do believe that the rapture could occur at any moment, that you could come back for your children. Lord, as the Word of God says, even so come, Lord Jesus. Save that one closest to hell in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So as I said, we want to talk about the tribulation period. It is a time that's coming up after the rapture of the church. It's going to be a time that this world has never experienced. Such devastation and uh, such travesty that will occur upon the earth. 
We're going to talk about the people that will be here. Uh, we're going to talk about the wicked ones that will be here. And we're going to talk about uh, the, the righteous that will be here. You mean there's going to be righteous people here during the tribulation period? I'm going to show you that by the Word of God. You just bear with me. So the book of the Revelation reveals this subject in great detail. But as I said, we won't go through every, every bowl and trumpet and vial. And, uh, we won't go through all of that this morning and all that God's going to uh, pour out upon this earth. But I do want to give us a, a pretty clear synopsis of everything that's going to occur. The Bible gives us uh, many names for this period called the tribulation. I'm not going to read all the ones we have down here, but the Bible calls it the day of the Lord, a time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, a great day of his wrath, the hour of his judgment. And we're going to be talking about those days plus this individual that we've already mentioned called the Antichrist. He is the focal point. He is the central figure during this seven-year period on the earth. Now, with that said, I'm going to give you a little robology before we start, okay? Maybe I should step over here out of the pulpit. But I'm going to give you what I call robology. And that's, I can't prove this by the Word of God. This is, this is what I've deduced and what I believe. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with any part of robology. But you've got to agree with God and the Word of God. Amen? There's a difference. So I'm going to give you some robology right here, what I believe. I believe that when the Antichrist steps on the scene, I believe he'll be 30 years old. Because anti is the opposite of and against. I believe he will mirror what the Lord Jesus Christ did. The Lord Jesus Christ came into his ministry on this earth and when he was 30 years old. And it lasted about three and a half years till he's about 33 and a half when he was crucified at the hands of an angry mob. I believe the Antichrist will step on the scene at 30 years old and will come into power. Now, you can disagree with that and that's fine. And therefore, if I believe the rapture could occur tomorrow, that means that I believe this man's walking around in body. Now, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute on who I truly believe the spirit of the Antichrist will be. And, uh, and I'm going to give you some scriptures to deal with that. But the Bible gives us many, many names for this man called the Antichrist also. I've got a ton here. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, the little horn, he's called in Daniel. Uh, the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians. And the son of perdition and here in our scriptures. The lawless one in our scriptures. The Antichrist in 1 John. The beast in Revelation chapter number 11. We're talking about a period of time called the tribulation period that where the central figure will be the Antichrist. Anti meaning opposite of, anti meaning against. And this man, this son of perdition, this, this man of sin, the lawless one, will be against everything Christ stands for, will be against everything good, and will yet be a mirror image to fool people on this earth. The Antichrist. This is an age the tribulation period, an age of seven years. The Bible says this in Matthew 24, 21 through 22. For then shall be great tribulation. Listen, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. There should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. This is a period of time of seven years on this earth after the church is gone that God is going to unleash His undiluted wrath upon the world. God is going to just un pour out His wrath undiluted upon every human being that is upon the face of the earth. And if you want to take time and you go home and sit down and you read the book of the Revelation and you read about uh, some of the plagues that are going to take place and, and how so much of the population is going to be destroyed, the oceans are going to be destroyed, all these things, God is going to pour out His wrath that is being held back now. He is going to pour that out on the face of the earth for seven years that we call the Great Tribulation 
period of time. You see, for the last 2,000 plus years, you know what God has done? God has poured His love out to mankind uh, during the church age through His precious Son. Uh, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He's poured His love out to this world, and the world has rejected it. And now when the tribulation comes, His people are gone in the rapture. God is going to pour His wrath out upon this earth. I'm going to stop there and say, thank God I'm not going to be here. I'm glad I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm glad I'm a child of the King. I'm glad God made a way for me to escape this period of time. God said we've not been appointed under wrath. Thank God for that. Amen. We're going to escape this thing, but we should still know about it. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 31 that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Amen? And that's what's going to happen to this world. For three and a half years, especially the last part that we refer to as the Great Tribulation, it's going to be some of the most devastating uh, things the world has ever seen. So bad that the Bible teaches us men will run and try to hide from God. Now think about that. How can you hide from an omniscient, omnipresent God? How can you hide from a God that knows everything and is everywhere, and yet men will try to do exactly that? The Bible says in Revelation 6, 16 and 17, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to? To stand. The Bible teaches us that men's hearts will fail them for fear. When they see all of this that's taking place on the earth, that mankind's hearts will fail them for fear. And I'm going to stop there and make this statement. Everyone who is not saved when the rapture occurs will automatically walk head straight into the tribulation period. You will go into the tribulation period. Think about the evil that we're already experiencing in today's time. Uh, if you watch the news, it's, uh, it's plumb scary. What's going on in our areas and what's going on uh, around our nation when we have what they call now these snatch and grabs in all the stores in the big cities. I don't go to the cities, amen. Uh, I don't like the crowds and I don't feel safe. I don't go to see the smashing grabs of the mopeds that they're riding in New York now just to steal people's phones, to steal their wallets. Uh, uh, the illegals beating on the law enforcement the other day in New York and then just turned back out on the streets. Mardi Gras just finished up last week. I heard a religious leader on TV talking about Mardi Gras. And it just, to me, is a perfect example of today's time that we're living in. And speaking, he said this. He said, isn't it great that so many men uh, left their time of partying to come over here and get closer to God? And I thought to myself, yeah, they left their drinking, their cursing, the nudity, and all the ungodliness that is going on. And you're going to tell me that they left that to come over here and now get religious and get closer to God. Church, that's not the way this thing works. If you can go over there and you can do the drinking and the drugs and the nudity and all that garbage they're doing, you better find out who your Savior is. Amen? You better check up. So the police, uh, then they admit they have very little control over much of what's going on uh, when these things occur. Uh, they've been stripped of their power in many places. But I'm going to tell you this. God sees all, God knows all, and one day God's going to judge all. They're not going to get away with it. Nobody is. So every lost person that is alive when the rapture occurs, they are going to walk head straight forward into the seven years that we refer to as the tribulation period or the tribulation age, whichever terminology you would like to use. Have you ever felt like you were born in the wrong time? I hear people say that, uh, you know, I, I should have been born back when. I'd love to live uh, in the Wild West. Uh, we went to Alaska several years ago, and, uh, and there's much, much of the 
I guess Wild West, the gold rush uh, period of time, uh, still there. They hadn't updated things. You still go in those same uh, places, dirt floors, sawdust, sawdust floors. And I remember we went back and I even thought then, what had it been like to live during this period of time? Uh, and I forget which gunslinger it was, and they still had the gun above, uh, above the, the bar area there in this p particular saloon that we just went through. And, and, and they had the gun still hanging up there because you had to turn your guns in when you come into town, and you got it when you left. But apparently they, the story that's written on the walls, he had to leave prior to the store opening up to get his gun. He was run out of town. He never came back to get it, and it was still hanging. And I don't remember which one of the gunslingers uh, famous gunslingers it was, but I thought, what a time it must have been. You know, many people say, you know, I wish I'd have lived during the, the age of the Wild West in the expansion area. Or I wish I'd have lived during New Testament times uh, where I could have seen the Lord Jesus Christ, where I could have heard the Apostle Paul. Or maybe some said, I'd like to live in the Old Testament times and heard the prophets of Ezekiel and Isaiah and hear all these prophets and, and see what was going on and all the miracles and the different things. But I've never heard one person Say, I'd like to live in the tribulation age. Why? Because it's going to be the worst time that this world has ever seen. Ever seen. Paul refers to it in our text in Second Thessalonians in verse number 7. He said, for the mystery of iniquity, which is lawlessness, uh, doth already work, meaning it's being revealed. The mystery. I said this, I think, in our scripture, in our uh, message last week. When the Bible speaks of a mystery, it's not a Scooby Doo whodunit mystery. A mystery is something that was prophesied in times past that is now being revealed in our time. Paul's saying these things that were prophesied are now being revealed. This, this lawlessness that is going on, these things are coming to pass. But what's got to happen here? What's keeping? What is keeping this mystery of iniquity? Uh, what is keeping this wicked one, the Antichrist? Uh, what is keeping the tribulation period from starting? The church. The church. We're here. I know the church is here because I'm here. Amen? And I've been born again. I know I've been saved by the grace of God. I'm the only one here today that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that's been saved because I can't know about anyone else. And if you've been saved, you're the only one that truly knows about yourself, and we don't know about anyone else. But verse 7 here tells us, again, the mystery of iniquity has already worked. Only he who now leadeth will let until he be taken out of the way. You see, if we were going to the book of Acts, we read about the day of Pentecost when the church came into existence. Uh, that is the birthday of the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, when they stood and they spoke, uh, and, and, and cloven uh, fire hung above them, and they spoke not in unknown tongues, but in other tongues, meaning they spoke in languages. So everyone there received a clear presentation of the gospel. And when they spoke the gospel, the Holy Ghost of God fell, and the church was born. And the Holy Ghost of God is with the church today. And He lives in our hearts. He's the one that brings conviction. He's the one that draws us to Christ. He's the one that points us to Christ. And He came in with the church. He'll stay with the church. And He'll go out with the church. And so as long as the church is here, uh, the Antichrist cannot come into power. Power. I didn't say revealed. I said come into power. He cannot come into power because it is the Holy Ghost of God that is withholding him and keeping him from coming into power. Now what happens when the church is taken away? In the rapture, then the world goes into that seven years of tribulation. Then the Antichrist, for the lack of better words, uh, is going to basically have full reign to do what he wants to do. He's going to say what he wants to say. He's going to go where he wants to go. He's going to do whatever pleases him, when it pleases him, to whoever he pleases to do it to. Because what is restraining him now, the Holy Ghost of God, the church, will be taken out of the way. And there's only going to be a couple things. The righteous that will stand in his way, will stand in and contend him during this seven years. Again, preacher, you say there's going to be righteous people. You just told me 
that the saved people are leaving during the rapture and everyone going in to the tribulation period are going to be unsaved, therefore ungodly. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. But I'm going to talk to you about two groups of people, and I'll talk about them in a few minutes. And they are the two witnesses. We'll talk about who, we, who they are, who I believe they are, and who others believe they are. The two witnesses, and then we have 144,000 saved Jewish men missionaries that are going to preach the gospel of the everlasting kingdom around the world. We're going to talk about those here in just a minute. But this man, the Antichrist, he's going to step on the scene. He's going to be a ruler, a leader like no man has ever seen. He's going to be charismatic. He's going to be extremely smart, but he's going to be brutal. He's going to be deceptive. He's going to be a liar because he's of Satan, which, uh, which is the father of lies. And he's going to deceive people. He's going to make some of the worst leaders, Lenin and Hitler and these others, he's going to make them look like choir boys. Amen. He's going to be so brutal in what he's doing. We listen to our smooth-talking politicians today. I'm telling you, he'll put them to shame. He'll be the, the most, for the lack of a better term, maybe successful leader of all the leaders. And that he will, he will draw people to him and he will encompass a group and he will pull nations together. We won't get into all that. But he'll pull a group of seven nations together and those nations will come together and he'll rule them all. He's going to be a ruler of this world, this man called the Antichrist. Why will he be so successful? Well, because the church and the Holy Ghost is not here to oppose him. And we're told in the Word of God that in the last three and a half years of this period of time that we refer to as the Great Tribulation, that he's going to demand that everyone bows down and worships him. That'll be a time when the eyes of the Jews are open and they'll realize they've been duped. They'll realize that they've been fooled when he demands they worship him. And here's the key, and we talk about it. We'll talk about it a little more. Uh, but he's going to demand that everyone takes the mark of the beast. Right? 600, three score, and six. Nobody likes that number, do we? You go to the store, they tell you your, your bill is 666. You sort of cringe, don't you? Can you not add something to it? Can I say this real quick? We don't have to be fearful of that. It don't bother me none. I don't have to be fearful of that. I'm saved by the grace of God. My God's perfect number is seven. Amen? Seven's the number of perfection. Six is the number of man. Imperfection. So we don't, we don't have to be fearful of that. So, so he'll, but he'll demand these people uh, follow him, worship him. He'll make them have the mark of the beast, his mark to where you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't do anything unless you're one of his followers. That's the way it is. Those that refuse to bow down to him, those who refuse to take the mark of the beast will pay the ultimate price. They'll probably be beheaded or some other brutal form of death for refusing to take the mark of the beast. Revelations 12, 11 says this, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. There will be those that John speaks about in the book of the Revelation as, the tri as those saints that come in out of the great tribulation, a number which no man can number. There will be those that will refuse the mark of the beast. There will be those uh, that will give their life instead of following him. And because of their actions, they will be saved. How? Again, by overcoming him by the blood of the Lamb. Salvation only comes through the blood of the Lamb. Now, we're living under the dispensation of grace. I understand that. And the dispensation of grace will end at the rapture. And it starts a whole different dispensation uh, as we get there. So, I'm trying to stay on track here. I want to stay in order. That's why I've got so many notes. So they've rejected God's Son. Now they've turned to God and they're going to receive God's anger. And they're going to, they've rejected His Son and they're going to receive the Antichrist. Well, what does the Bible say? Listen to verse 11 and 12 that we just read in our text. Listen to them again. And for this cause, 
What cause? Because they, in verse number 10, because they received not the truth that they might be saved. Because they rejected God's gift, because they rejected the Son of God, because they rejected Jesus and His great plan of salvation. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, we could have a long discussion, and there's, there's many different thoughts and, and such on, you know, well, if people reject God now, uh, you see, I, I've brought you the best message that could ever be given, and that's that there is salvation in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. By grace are you saved through faith. That is the greatest gift I could give anyone here, just that knowledge. However, if you reject that knowledge, that is what you will be judged. And I just become your worst enemy because I have given you uh, the, the way to salvation, the way to get to God. You have rejected that. And because of that, you'll experience damnation if you do not change your mind. So we can talk about those that are, are, are alive now that have received a clear presentation of the gospel and they have rejected God's Son, are they able to be saved in the tribulation? I'm not going to answer that now to what I believe. And, or I'll tell you what I believe. I'll tell you what I believe. I believe no. Because the Bible says here that God will send them strong delusion that they all might be damned. They rejected His Son. And now he's going to send them strong delusion that believe a lie, the Antichrist. Now, I'm not going to stand. Stay, if you disagree with me on that, that's fine. That's fine. But I believe that when we, we've had opportunity now to be saved by the grace of God, if we've had a clear presentation of the gospel and we've rejected that, and if we won't accept Christ under the dispensation of grace and then God sends strong delusion that we should believe a lie, that we should be damned. What makes me think that those people would be saved? Now, there'll be a lot of people throughout the tribulation born, come to the age of accountability around this world, and there'll be a lot of people get saved. And they're going to get saved in a different manner, although it is still through the blood. I, this is bad because I'm right now getting ready to go to point one. I, I'm going to do my best to hurry up and be done in about 15, 20 minutes. I promise you. So what is the purpose? I'm going to go through some of this real quick. What is the purpose of the tribulation period? Well, there are several reasons, but I'm going to give you a couple real quick. Number one is to prepare Israel for the Messiah. You see, Israel, uh, they believe, the Jews believe that Jesus has already come. I went to Israel several, several years ago. I don't know, Karen might tell you the year. Uh, I don't remember. It's been a long time ago. And I went to Israel, and when I was there, they had big banners hanging up over the streets that said, Even so come Messiah. They were looking for Jesus to come the first time. They were looking for Him to come and to rule and to reign. But you see, Christ didn't come as a leader. Christ didn't come as a king and a ruler. He came as a lowly lamb, as a savior for mankind. And they missed Him, and they crucified Him on a rugged cross. But they'll realize during the tribulation period, three and a half years in, when the, when the Antichrist says, worship me, they will realize when he, stay, when he sits in the, throne, uh, in the temple of God saying he is God, they will realize that they've been duped, that they've been fooled and believed a lie. It is to prepare the Jews to prepare the Jews for the Messiah. Paul tells us throughout the chapters 9, 10, and 11 in the book of Romans that God has not forgotten the Jews and He's going to return to the Jews. You see, the Jews may have rejected the Lord and they may have forgotten God, but God's not forgotten them. And God has a special plan when He's dealing with the Jews. Those are His people, the apple of His eye. Those are His chosen people. And any time we're dealing with prophecy, we must first see how that prophecy uh, is, is towards the Jewish people, the Hebrews, the Israelites. So the Jews are looking for the Lord to come because they think He's not come yet. But during the tribulation period, they're going to realize that. They're going to realize they crucified the Son of God. But what is the other reason for the tribulation period? It is to pour out judgment on the unrighteous. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, 21, 
For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. When we read this, we need to understand and realize that when we reject the Son of God today, and people do it all the time, when people reject the Son of God today, uh, they don't see that as a very bad thing. They don't see it as a, as a terrible offense to turn away God's Son. But I'm telling you that God sees it as a major offense when you turn away His Son that He gave to die in your place. And when we go, when the rapture of the church occurs and the ungodly are left, God is going to pour out His wrath upon this world and upon the ungodly, and He will judge them. And they are going to experience a sorrow like no one has ever experienced before. Point two, and the good thing is I only have two points. Of course, there's always them sub-points. They get you every time. Point two, I just want to look at the participants in the tribulation period, and I just want to give you about three of those real quick. The participants in the tribulation period. First of all, we have the false prophet and the Antichrist during, that will reign during this tribulation period. The Bible in the book of the Revelation 13, 16 through 18 says this, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that, he, save that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So what will the false prophet be doing? What will this false prophet be doing? Well, if you were to go back to the four Gospels, you read about a man named John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a forerunner for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember John the Baptist standing on the, uh, on the seashore and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, this is what the, the false prophet will be doing. He will be pointing people to the Antichrist like John the Baptist pointed people to the real Christ and the true Christ. That will be his job. That's what he will do. So what will the Antichrist be doing? will be exercising his power. He'll have the ability to, to exercise his power like he never has before. In the 13th chapter of the book of the Revelation in verse 16, the Bible says, He causeth. He causeth what? He causeth, the Bible says there, that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I believe the very foundations for that are being laid today. I don't remember where it was. It was, it was. In fact, it was probably close to a year ago, I guess now. And I went into a store, a, uh, uh, just a little conven gas station convenience store. Uh, I mean, I thought they'd take anything. I thought you'd go in there and trade a goat for a Coke if you needed to. I thought they'd take anything. But I went in there, and they would not take my cash. You need to pay with debit. You need to pay with credit. I said, I have cash. Our very Constitution says you have to accept this. We don't accept cash. They are laying the groundwork today for a one-world government and a one-world currency. And when everything we do is on that little piece of plastic and everything we do has a, has a transaction and ha has a, 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 a following that you can follow it right back, you can't hide money, and if you got it hid, you can't use it. And what good is it? They know everything you have, everything you spend. I'm talking about during the tribulation period, but I'm telling you, we're laying the groundwork now. And they, can, they know everything you do, and they will decide what you need and how much of it you're going to have. And if you don't have the mark of the beast, you can pull that card out, you can pull that cash out, and they're going to say, sorry, can't help you. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be a visible mark in your hand, your forehead, or if it's something that they're, that they're going to scan. I don't know if it's something that they embed in you to where all you do is walk out the door and it deducts it. It knows exactly what you bought because everything will have the code on it. There'll come a day where you don't have to stay. You know, we've already gone to, you don't have cashiers. I try not to shop anywhere that don't have a cashier. Fred Akins is here this morning and he said it and I've said it a thousand times since then. I don't remember putting an application in at this place. I'm not checking myself out. 
And I tell them, well, you go over there and do self-checkout. I say, do you not realize you're putting yourself out of a job? I want somebody to do it for me. I, I'm here. I want somebody to check me out. I want to interact with somebody. I want to talk with somebody. I want to pay somebody. I don't want to do it myself. It's not I'm lazy. I, when I go to McDonald's or, or where I don't go to that kiosk in order, I walk up there. Well, you can order at the kiosk. I know I can, but I'm not. Well, you need to. I walk out the door. I'm just not going to do that. So he's going to cause them to have that. He's going to begin to flex his strength and his muscles. And we're already seeing that today. We're already seeing people that stand for the truth. The word of today is canceled. You stand up for what's right, you get canceled. You stand against homosexuality, you get canceled. Uh, you stand up against abortion, you get canceled, right? Uh, that's the world we live in. I'm telling you, we're living in a, in a lawless society now. We're moving that way. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen? Even so come, Lord Jesus. Can you just imagine uh, during this tribulation period uh, that a mother... And, and I'm not going to say a mother and her children because if it's right after the rapture, uh, her children are gone in the rapture if they're not of the age of accountability. But maybe it's a mother uh, that's gone in the grocery store with her two grown children and she gets a whole basket full of groceries uh, to feed her family for the next week and she gets to check out and they say, we need to see the mark. I don't have the mark. Well, then you can't have the groceries. You can't have peanut butter, you can't have bread, you can't have anything. Well, I'll grow my own stuff. Well, you can't buy the seeds. You can't buy the seed potatoes. You can't buy the beans. You can't buy anything you need without the mark of the beast. But I don't want to take the mark. Well, then that's where it's going to cost you your life. And I believe it's going to be so brutal during this tribulation period of time that I believe when a parent... And maybe they have a, a 13, 14-year-old child, a 15-year-old child living with them. And, uh, and they come and say, you'll take the mark of the beast and you'll worship the Antichrist. And you say, no, I won't. Just go ahead and kill me. I don't believe it'll be that simple. I believe they'll begin to take your children and maim your children in front of you. Now you're willing to take it? Are we going to take it or are we not? How strong are we? I don't want to find out. I'm not going to have to find out. Amen. Not going to have to find out. I don't want to get into all that. But So the Bible goes on in verse number 18. Who is this man? Here is wisdom. For the number of a man is the number of 603 score and 6. So who is the Antichrist? Who do you believe it will be, preacher? I've had it ask me a thousand times. Who is the Antichrist? Well, I'm going to tell you what I believe. There's only two men in the Bible that are referred to as the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist, and that's Judas Iscariot. This is what I believe. I believe that the Antichrist could be walking, who he is, I don't know. I do believe you'll have to be a Jewish. You'll have to be Jewish. The Jews would never follow somebody that wasn't a Jew. So I believe you'll have to be of Jewish descent. This is more, this is Ravology, I guess, right here. You'll have to be of Jewish descent, I believe. And then I believe that the spirit of Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, will enter into that man, and he will be the Antichrist. You say, preacher, now you're out there now. I might be, but I think these Bible to show that. The son of perdition. You show me different, and I'll read it. But the Bible calls Judas Iscariot the son of perdition. The Bible calls the Antichrist the son of perdition. The only two people. And I believe that it'll be the Spirit. Now, we've heard all kinds of names. We've heard uh, John F. Kennedy and Henry Kissinger and the Pope and uh, Barack Obama and Donald Trump. They're all the Antichrist. Amen? But they're not. They're not. But I believe that the Spirit of Judas Iscariot. Now, some would say, well, it couldn't be Judas Iscariot because he was a Christian. No, he wasn't. In fact, Jesus said himself, I have, not, uh, have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil? Jesus knew. And why did he say that? Because he wanted the devil to know. I know which one's yours, and I know who's among me, and I know who's stirring this stuff up, and I know who the trouble is. Judas and the Antichrist, both referred to as the son of perdition. John 17, 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me have I kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. 
That's what I believe. Now, you can disagree with me on that, and you could think it's someone else, or you just have no way of knowing, and it might not, I might not be right, but that's some of my robology. But we do know that the church will be gone. We do know the, before the Antichrist can come into power, I'm trying to skip ahead. We do know that. So how, how do we know these things? How do, we know that if a, how do we know that if a person takes this mark of the beast I'm talking about, that they're doomed forever? How do we know that? Well, we go back to the Word of God. Revelations 14, 9 through 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. If you take the mark, if you're here, if you're not saved and you go into the tribulation and you miss the rapture and you take the mark of the beast, you are going to uh, invite the wrath of God to come down upon your life and you will experience the wrath of God. The Bible said in Revelation 16 too, and the first wind poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And so all this going on, the false prophet, the Antichrist, they are going to participate during the tribulation period. But as I promised you and told you a little bit, there's some righteous people that will be here. And I'm going to touch on them real quick and try to move through them quickly. Number uh, 2 here in, in the Revelation chapter number 11, verse 3 through 6. I won't take time to read it all. Uh, there's a uh, talks about these two witnesses that will be here for 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. They will be here, and they will be a thorn in the side of the Antichrist. Uh, they will be preaching during that time. And, and now, who are these men? Well, just about every scholar believes that one of them is Elijah. Just every, about every scholar does. The other witness is the one that people get hung up on. Many believe it to be Enoch because... The Bible says, appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Well, we know that both Elijah and Enoch were translated, and neither one of them experienced death. But I don't believe that that argument holds a lot of water because we're talking about what's happening right after the rapture, and how many of us are not going to experience death if we're alive at the rapture? Right? So then other scholars, and I started to say myself included, but I'm not a scholar, but I believe what these scholars do. I believe that the other one will be Moses. Why do I believe that? For two reasons. Number one, God has already brought back Elijah and Moses one time at the transfiguration of Christ. He's already brought them back once. And number two is when you read the miracles that these two men will perform, such as a drought, such as turn, which Elijah did for three and a half years. He, he had a drought in the Old Testament. Same thing will happen during the tribulation period. And then Moses, uh, the Bible speaks about them turning to, bringing plagues and turning the water to blood. Moses did all that when the children come out of the land of Egypt. I believe it'll be Elijah and Moses. Others believe it'll be two people just out of the tribulation period. I'm not exactly sure where they get that thought process from, but I believe it'll be Moses and Elijah. You can disagree with Matt, me with that. I've told you many times, you don't have to agree with me. It is your prerogative to be wrong if you want to be. You do not have to agree with me. Amen? <laughs> so, anyway, Revelations 11, 3 through 4 says, And I will give, you know, I'm just kidding. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. The, uh, these are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. These two witnesses are going to be preaching the gospel. Not the gospel of grace like we do. But they're going to be preaching the gospel, and they have special power. I'm going to give you about five things here real quick. Number one, they have power to protect themselves. Let me, let me get to Revelations chapter 11. I should have already turned there. Revelations chapter 11. If you're quick, you can turn there too, because I'm having to turn. I didn't mark it for some reason. Revelations chapter 11. Verse 5, they have power to protect themselves. Listen to what it says. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth 
their enemies. Wow. And if any man hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So they have power during this 42 months to protect themselves because the Antichrist would kill them immediately. Not only that, they have powers, as I just said, in verse 6, to stop the rain. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So for three and a half years, no rain will fall. You think about that. How does that affect the food supply? How does it affect a lot of things? How many of our wells would go dry in three and a half years with no rain? Around here, we, we get about three or four weeks, seems like, in a row sometimes with no rain. And we begin to put on water restrictions and we call it a major drought. Three and a half years, no water. So they have power to stop the rain. But they also have a limited time to do all this. As I said in verse number uh, three, the Bible says that they will have 1,203 score days. That's 42 months at 30 days a month, which is the Jewish calendar. That's 42 months, which is three and one half years. So they have a limited time in which to do this. So they've got a job to do that God has given them. And during that time, they must get this job done. And the fourth thing I want you to know about these two witnesses is they will be killed. The Bible says, look at verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, I love that line. And when they shall have finished their testimony. In other words, just like us, God had a job for them to do, and when that job is complete, then they can go home. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So they will be killed. He comes out of the bottomless pit, makes war, kills them, but not until they have finished their testimony. Up until that point in time, anyone that come against them, fire would come out of their mouths and devour them. But the Antichrist wants to, wants to be known that they're dead. So now he comes out after 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, he kills them. Look what happens in verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. Hold on, think about that. These men that have been, for three and a half years, they've been uh, preaching, standing in opposition of the Antichrist. They've been standing in opposition of everything he says, everything he does, warning people. And now after three and a half years, when the time of their testimonies are, when God is finished with them, the beast comes, he slays them. The Antichrist wants everybody to know, hey, I'm big dog. I'm the one on top here. I've just killed those two witnesses that were bringing you all this grief. He lets their bodies lay in the streets under the hot sun for three and a half days. Can you imagine the headlines on CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and every station around the world that we would see, uh, that people would see these bodies laying in the streets, deteriorating, decaying under the hot sun. Maybe animals come at night and begin to, to ravage those bodies. And every day they're showing those pictures. And the Antichrist is on TV bragging because he had them killed. I've got the power to kill them. They will be killed. They will be killed. And I, let me go on and read the next verse because it shows that the wickedness of men. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because, they, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. I mean, they're going to treat it like Christmas time. These two prophets are dead. Let's go buy a gift and celebrate. Dance and make merry. That is how depraved the world will be during this time. These men that could breathe out fire to protect themselves are now dead. Now dead. But my last point with them is their bodies are going to be resurrected. Let, oh, I like that. Amen. <laughs> Let's look at this again in verse number 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. 
and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now their bodies have been laying there dead three and a half days. Your body starts decaying. And their bodies may have been going through a decaying process and animals like I said and no telling how they've been brutally treated during that time. But after three and a half days, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of life enters back into them <laughs> and they stand up in great fear. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine the fear that would be in the hearts of people when they've watched the Antichrist kill them after they've tormented them, just simply telling them not to follow the Antichrist, don't listen to him. But they tormented them. Their torments come because they stopped the rain for three and a half years, turned the water to blood. Plagues are coming as the judgment of God. And they're so happy that these men are dead. In three and a half days they stand to their feet. Well, that'd terrorize anybody, wouldn't it? Amen? That would terrorize any of them. So they're going to be there. They're righteous. But then the last thing righteous I want to look at is the 144,000. I want to look at that real quick. The 144, I'm getting on through here. I'm on number 19, if you're keeping count. Amen? So we're getting near the end. I'm just hitting the highlights. Revelation chapter number 7. Revelation chapter 7, in verse 2 through 4, the Bible says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And you can read on down through there of each tribe and twelve thousand from each tribe. And when I went to school, Old Mass said twelve times twelve thousand is a hundred and forty four thousand. Now, New Math, I don't know. But I believe it's 144,000 Jewish missionaries that will minister to the earth during this tribulation period. Now, boy, we, I've gone back and I've, I've read about and I've got books of sermons from missionaries and sermons from preachers of old that, uh, that did mission. Where there been a lot of great preachers and missionaries like the Apostle Paul on this earth. But I don't believe any of them will carry out the ministry that this 144,000 does as they come and they begin to preach. Not the gospel of grace. Not the gospel of grace that says just come. Just come and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Just come and confess your sins. He will forgive you like today. But they will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So who are these 144,000? Who are these Jewish missionaries? Well, and I try not to get up here and just lambast or talk about necessarily other denominations. But the Seventh-day Adventists, they come around, they'll knock on your doors, and they will tell you that the 144,000 are Seventh-day Adventists. And that some of them have even made the claim that they're part of that 144,000. Well, we know that's just simply not true. Because it doesn't, not because I believe it's not true, because it doesn't line up with the Word of God. The Bible says here, in verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. Well, they've got a seal that's been placed upon them. Next time they knock on your door and they want you to buy their literature, say, show me the seal. If you're part of the 144,000. It's not there. Plus this time period, the, the time for the 144,000 to witness is not here yet. This is still future. The church is still here. They come after the church. And as I said, they're Jews. They're Jews. The Bible tells us in the third verse of chapter 14, I won't take time, well, I will read it. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and the be and the, before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So they know a song that nobody else knows. Nobody else knows. The Bible also tells us in uh, chapter 14 and verse 4 that they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, the 144,000. There are also men that you can read uh, in chapter 14 and verse 4 again. It tells they were redeemed from among men. These are 
144,000 Jewish men, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel in the future during the tribulation that God will put a seal upon their forehead, that God will give them a message to preach, and God will put a song in their heart that only they know, and they will go out and testify and witness to God. Only them. Only them. So it's not happened yet. So it cannot be them. I told you I was trying to move on through. So what their, their message, what is this gospel of the kingdom? Well, the Bible says in Matthew 24, 13 and 14, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And, and then shall the end come. Come. So they're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? What, is, what, is they, what are they going to preach? Well, if we go back to our scriptures earlier where the Antichrist causeth them, in other words, they can't buy, they can't sell unless they take the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their hand. I believe these 144,000 Jewish missionaries are going to go around the world preaching the gospel of the king, a, a kingdom, opposing everything the Antichrist stands for. In other words, they're going to stand and they're going to tell people, I don't care what happens. Don't take the mark of the beast. Turn to God the Father. I don't care if they're threatening your children. If your children take the mark, if your family takes the mark, don't take the mark. You'll damn yourself to hell. Turn to God the Father. And they will have to give their lives. You see, we're on the dispensation of grace. All you got to do is ask Christ to come into your heart and life. It's like I heard a preacher say one time, again, leading back to those that, are, that refuse Christ now. If you just won't accept him when he offers it to you freely, what makes me think you're willing to die for it then? And that's what's going to happen. They're going to have to be willing to lay down their life in order that they might not be damned for all of eternity. So they're going to be going about preaching do not take the mark. Do not take the mark. This is the page we've been looking for. Revelations chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. I'm going to read. We're closing. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Revelation seven fourteen, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Notice the verbiage there. And washed their, and have washed their robes. To be saved during that time, in the, in the dispensation of the gospel of the kingdom, after the rapture's occurred, now we're in grace. But to be saved during that time, it requires something. It requires you to stand true until the end. To endure till the end. And it will cost you your life. Now, it costs you nothing. Christ paid everything. The two witnesses, they had special power. These 144,000, they had a special message. But you need to know that Christ gave his life for you, and you can escape all that we talked about if you just give your heart and your life to him now. Let's all stand just for a moment. All heads bowed and all eyes closed while Sister Valerie plays, just for a moment. I don't know your heart, only... I do know it's through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to prolong the service, but if you've never been saved and you want to be saved, come up here and see me. Let me take the Bible. No Robology. I'll take the Bible and show you what it says about salvation. Exactly what God said. It's so simple to be saved. So simple that even I can do it. We're not going to prolong the service. Is there one would raise a hand and just say, Preacher, I'm not saved. Would you pray for me? I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. But I do want to pray for you. 
Father God, we thank you for the privilege to preach this morning, Lord. And I'm thankful, Lord God, that I will not be here during that terrible time. I am so thankful that I will take part in the rapture of the church. For I know that I know that I know that I've given my heart and life to you and I've been saved and sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost and that I'm yours. Father, by the testimony of those here today, Lord God, they, uh, they're testifying that they have also been saved, Lord, and we surely hope that is the case. But Lord, if there's one that's listening online or has never had you, uh, accepted you as their Savior, I pray this would be the day that they would do that very thing. Father, I thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you'd be seated just a moment. 